My name is Niusha and I am the curator of this panel and I will be moderating the discussion. Two years ago this time, we presented an intervention panel at the NYC School of Data to address data invisibility. We proposed that the way data is being collected and analyzed is unnuanced and detached from the latest sociocultural progressions, especially in queerness, race, and disability. We talked about how the non-binary Middle Eastern or transnational people on our panel are never represented in any data set. Gender is always binary in the commercial and civil data world, and the current race categories reduces complex identities into inaccurate buckets that benefits no one but the status quo. We also showed how courtroom data could be choreographed into a dance piece and how facial recognition data can be weaponized by governments to tag gay people at the borders. Today, we pick up where we left off. We will discuss why data is the new power and how, like any other forms of power, it is performative. It can be used to manipulate, oppress, and invisibilize subjects, or it can be leveraged to empower and shed light to expose systemic inequities, especially when it's open access. We acknowledge that the concept of data performativity is a little bit abstract, and frankly, performance studies theories make my brain fuzzy at times. So please consider this panel as a ritual to develop semi-raw ideas with presenters and audiences in the same room. We invite you to think about how data can be performative in various contexts. Please share your thoughts with us at the end of our presentation during the Q&A. Our first panelist will be joining us virtually, and first I will show her pre-recorded presentation here. My dear participants and visitors of NYC School of Data. Unfortunately, I couldn't join the panel in person, but I'm happy to share some of my research recording and zoom into the Q&A session. It's a peculiar time to give a talk on how data performs while we are observing different impressions of it during the hybrid world, from Google Maps being used to mark strike points by Russian troops to anonymous international activist hacker collective, cyber attacking Russian governments or websites and TV channel. It's definitely not the first time we witness cyber components of warfare. But since the framing of what I call the war in Europe carries a connotation of a global influence and attention that other regions don't experience, it might be the time when the tactics of the 21st century warfare are made especially visible. The question of visibility and data performance are central to my short talk. But there is a pathway of thought that leads us there. If I took a theoretical direction with it, it would take us a long time to get there. But a turn towards artistic means can transport us much faster, which is one of the appeals of studying the world through it. So I begin with Trevor Paglin's work. They took the faces of the accused and the dead. It's a canvas of 3,240 mark shots that is too wide, too tall for a spectator or for the camera lens to capture. The data passing in front of it is one of the circulated images of the canvas. By bringing human into the frame, the photographer builds a relationality to the overwhelming scale of the grid. I want you to think for a second about the choreography of engaging with the artwork and the physical space. Those are quotidian motions. A step in action, a half turned head, following one image after another, building connections between them based on their placement in the grid how they're framed and stylized. Those gestures and thought processes are almost choreographically instructive of the engagement with the large-scale work and with the large-scale data that it invokes. Tracing back the origin story of U.S. surveillance technologies, Adlin arrives to American National Standards Institute database that the U.S. government sourced for mark shots to use them as a trait, which is an initial set of information used to teach the software and algorithm. In this case, it was used to build an early facial recognition software in the U.S. For his grid, Paglen took 3,240 mark shots from the same archive and retouched them by uh, crossing out the eyes of the depicted with narrow white boxes in attempts to cover some parts of their privacy given for the need of data. Retouched and aligned, images create stylistically homogeneous black and white grid that blurs most of the features of the depicted centering suspect hood, 
and criminality as their common trait. In other words, portrait becomes recognized as a mugshot in reference to surrounding images in the grid, invoking the idea of arrest and capture, just like a data that becomes conclusive in relation to the rest of the data set. The spectator moves from one mugshot to another, trying to make connections between individuals, yet to see the totality of the work, they will need to step away to the distance where the details become ungraspable in the larger context they were gathered for. What gets lost in the attempt to step away and classify their common framework? What becomes targeted? To expand on these questions, let me introduce a helpful concept of data informativity proposed by Tobias Matzer, media and algorithms researcher from Germany. I'll try to do it with a minimal overload. In simple terms, Informativity is a power of language to create what it states, rather than just describing actions. For example, making a promise that you will hold, performing a wedding ceremony, or announcing a verdict as a judge. Several theories develop their nuanced thought on how performative statements shape the world we live in and our identities. You might be familiar with Judith Butler's notion about gender's performativity. The idea that gender is a phenomenon that is being produced and reproduced all the time through repetition or rejection of socially normalized gender behavior. Applying the data analysis to this concept, Meissner tries to articulate how it can establish itself as one's identity. On its own, a personal data activity is not very conclusive. It gains meaning in reference to the rest of the data set. In other words, in order to make a decision on whether to promote someone a certain product, allow them to pass the border, or arrest them as suspects, there needs to be a pattern of what users, citizens, consumers, with similar behavior select or enact and predict the possible preferable or deviant action. Prediction becomes a reality when an action is made upon its evidence, making the pattern trustworthy within the system. So a dating app match, Buying a product from a targeted app that read your mind, the tension of a suspect based on data analysis can be viewed as an expression of data performativity. Basically, it is a process when someone's, someone is established a certain subject through the algorithm based on a distinction or similarity to the attributes of the majority. Matzner is particularly alarmed by the fact that once deviates from the normal behavior of can be a reason for suspecting someone in a non-normative action. You can think about airport security or policing specific neighborhoods as some of the examples where the possibility of accusing someone is enough to stop or arrest a person. Martin's concerns of suspect detention function of big data are shared by Peglin, who attempts to excavate the origins of the determinism for capturing a suspect through his artistic work. This mugshot grid is not only a reference to the source of those images and the ethics of their use as training data, but also a gesture towards the history of the biometric detection. Unfortunately, I'm restricted by time to expand on the criminological background of biometric recognition that you can access in a short video footnote through this QR code uh, if you want to hear more. There are also more contemporary examples of structural biases of the basis of the algorithms that don't always use biometric data, but usually target race and class-related factors to establish one's inferior or deviant position. The process of targeting and suspecting itself becomes more important than the accuracy of the claim. The discourse on how data performs quite feasibly and visibly is not a call for dismantling the data-based algorithmic processes, which are the only way to sustain the scale of our world. It is rather an attempt to remind that we should think very carefully about the assumptions that created the classifications and methods used for big data analysis. It is also an invitation to consider what are the patterns that we want to multiply and nourish in the world, and whether we can get there without marking someone as an outcome. Thinking about the things I would want to highlight through data and this events theme, I wanted to share with you NYC Street Street Map a database of trees in your neighborhood, just in case you want to get to know them better and learn about ways of taking care of them while they are taking their lives. 
So thank you for listening. I forgot to read Anna's bio before playing that recorded presentation. I will read her bio now. Anna Rahim Shanova is a PhD student in performance studies at NYU. She holds a master's degree from the same department and majored in economics and world literature in her undergraduate program in Kazakhstan. She studies the performance of technologies for managing life and creating surplus and analyzes the movement of humans and non-humans that sustain the global circulation of commodities, money, labor power, and diseases. In her dissertation, she researches the transnational movement of people, goods, and technologies stimulated by the Belt and Road Initiative, China's global infrastructure project that develops land and maritime routes for trade and cooperation under the rhetoric of Silk Road's revival. We'll move on to our second panelist, Yakov Bressler. Yakov is a data engineer and theater producer. He is the creator of Op Open, da Open Broadway Data, a platform aimed at providing data for all Broadway shows since 1738. Yakov's tech focuses are in building safe and secure data platforms, such as data infrastructure, data privacy, and cloud development. His theater focuses are in producing, dynamic pricing, and open data development. Welcome to this talk. I'm going to speak a little bit about open Broadway data. My name is Yakov Bressler. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the problem with Broadway data. I'm going to talk about the evolution of this solution, which is a data platform, but why a data platform, why not something else? I'm going to talk to you about how we're maybe changing the future of Broadway with data, and then what comes next. Here's the problem. Broadway's been around since a long time ago. The first show that the starring in the room can argue about this, 1738. So that's 284 years ago. There's been over 10,000 shows in 365 theaters, and it's a lot of data. Where is it? Can you use it to answer interesting questions? The answer is not really. So that's not good. Here's a solution. Let's make that data available. Cool. Here's my solution. Open Broadway Data is an open data platform which aims to collect, display, and analyze data from all Broadway shows since 1738. How did we get here? Why data platform? Why not something else? The evolution of the technical requirements. That's a little bit of the story. And the evolution of the use cases. So to tell you about how I came to be here, we're going to rewind the clock, but we're going to traverse time instantly. So I'm going to talk to you about three phases of my life, my career, that got me to where I am today, that got this platform to where it was. Phase one, I was producing theater, and I wanted a historical data set to train and test predictive models. Pretty academic. The next phase, a few years later, I was working in tech, and people would reach out to me because I wrote an article. They're like, hey, remember that data set that you used? Can I have it? And so I would update it and send it to them. And then phase three is just after the George Floyd reckoning, I had social activists who reached out to me and said, hey, we're trying to prove this thing. We need data. Can you help us? So these are the motives. We go from one individual to like larger collective. And I think that's really like my personal. Let me show you a little bit about the technical requirements that go into this. I wish I could just say, yeah, it's Google Sheet. Go in, copy the rows you want, and it's done. It's a little bit more complicated. If this picture looks a little crazy to you, it is a little crazy. If you've ever built out something very technical, You'd be like, oh, this is a simplification. It's even more complicated. This stuff is difficult. So let's start with phase one, a little blue box, historical data set. I had the data on my computer. You want it? I'll email it to you. Phase two, you want the data too? Let me update it and send it to you. I could do a static file. If it's very big, I can send you in groups and zip. Okay, phase three, you want to add demographic data, whatever that means. In order to do that, you now need an editing interface. You need to be able to prove that and roll back and so on. But hang on a second. You're, you have demographic data? Where are you storing that? What information are you including? Are you including people's date of birth, their addresses, potentially? Which countries they've migrated from? Well, who knows? This is really sensitive. So you need to be able to store that in a way that protects these people's information. There's like a lot of components there. Okay, so let's zip up number five. Now, this thing's going to get really slow if you have a bunch of people using it at the same time. If you're doing large data manipulation, this thing needs to scale. Otherwise, you're waiting all day for it to work. And the last thing is, if we've got all this protected data that's uh, important and it's keeping people safety, you don't want to get hacked. So you have to be resilient. So this is a little bit of a story, a tiny, like, I would say, like, inch deep, mile wide view of 
the technical requirements that are required for us to get to this goal of helping social activists. Okay, so a little side note here, why so much cybersecurity stuff? Like, am I paranoid? Maybe I am. I mean, I work in tech, I, I, I guess we have reports and stuff, but at the end of the day, this platform needs to be trustworthy. You're not gonna approach an artist or an advocate, a activist and say, hey, tell me really important information that might get you put in jail in other countries about your identity without being absolutely confident that it's secure. And I guess like my quip is you don't want lists of names floating around the internet with all the people who are like identify as queer, living in Manhattan, doing this thing. That would be very bad. So that's why there's a lot of cybersecurity. Okay, so let's go out of how we made it. Let's talk about the use cases. Way back when, when I was producing theater, this is a question that I was trying to answer. How do you get a show to succeed? I'm not going to go deep here. If this is interesting to you, come speak to me after. I'm going to fly through here. Basically, this is a survival plot, and it says, doesn't matter how much people pay. If they're in the seats in a the theater, you're going to do well. It seems obvious. It's quantitative statistics here, so we'll skip it. Okay. How has show genres changed over time? The opera was really popular in the 1800s, and the musical is really popular in the 2000s, so there's this evolution. The credit goes to the kill Kamat. is up in the right corner. Okay, phase two. Other people asked for this data. Let's check in time. So who is who are these other people? I don't have any like math model to show you here, but like generally, the people who reach out to me the most were graduate students and researchers. And then decreasing frequency, theater producers, financial institutions, and media executives like HBO people. Because I guess they're like trying to build a new TV show. So other people are asking me for this data. And there's an endless amount of information to show you about all the things they worked on. And I can't really share it because it's not mine and I don't have time to ask them for permission. Here's just one glimpse. This is research from a then student, now I guess like doer, uh, Samantha Pierre. This is a quantitative model. I'm not going to go too much into it because it's, I don't really understand entirely. But basically, it asks the question, if you are nominated or win a Tony Award, what does that mean for your business? And the answer is not so clear. It may or may not be good. So that's pretty cool. So you can imagine like when it comes up to this phase, all right, here's a lot of stuff. Okay. So what you're seeing on this screen, you can't see anywhere else because the data is on our platform and you have to like go through the approval process. But before I get into it, the data here is sampled from any director on Broadway who's directed a show since the year 2010. Now, you don't need to be a mathematician to say, wow, this is dominated by, you look at blue, dominated by men. Most Broadway directors are men. Most Broadway directors are white. I don't need to tell you that it's 90%. If you look at the total count, the 95% of the total productions, just look at it. It's just, it's a wall of blue. There's one Asian director since 2010. One. Come on. That's ridiculous. Okay. So I'll speak a little bit about what, how we're, but you can appreciate that this data is now in the hands of people who've asked for it. That's pretty powerful. All right. I'm going to fly through. Line designers, all white men. Most of them graduate from Yale. Two students per year in the MFA program. Almost guaranteed a job as a Broadway line designer. Two per year. Orchestra contractors. These are people who hire the orchestra pit. Two, the three people have hired 80% of all orchestra musicians since the year 2000. Okay, so how can you change the future of Broadway? You can't fix a problem you can't see. And activists are using this data to open people's eyes. And they're using it to ask for systematic change. It's working. This project's key collaborators were the Black Theater Coalition. And with our data, they were able to secure over 30 fully paid apprenticeships for Black Broadway professionals to get their first careers, to get their start in the career. It seems obvious, right? You look at this data, you go, obviously. Okay, so what comes next? More activism. The people who care about these things need to find people like myself or platforms like this to keep going. And I'm still here, so let's go. And then we need to improve this data platform. I'm not going to go too much into it, but you can imagine this requires sophisticated technical platforms. It needs to be robust. The current functioning site is a POC. We kind of did it just to prove it could be done and get this one thing out the door. It needs to be revamped. We need more data. So we need organizations who want their data to be open and maybe want us to have it. So if you want to get involved, I need you. This platform needs you. If you're technical, we just participate. If you are from an organization that has data, we want to partner with you. And if you're a social activist, you get a little star because this platform is built for you. And let's solve problems together. Here's a little picture on some of the names of people who worked on this platform. It's not done by one person. It's a group of people. Thank you all of these people for 
doing the work that you do? Thank you, Yakov. Our third panelist is Adam Hafiz. Adam is a choreographer, composer, theorist, and curator. His work gathers a specialist from the fields of urban planning, data science, performance, architecture, visual arts, and environmentalism to collaborate within temporary or long-term structures he sets up. He established Haraka platform 15 years ago, which is an international platform creating a sustainable dialogue, research, and performances that have been presented at renowned venues, including La Mama Theater and MoMA PS1 in New York, Cairo Opera House in Egypt, Sharjah Architectural Triennial in the United Arab Emirates, and Hebel M. Ufer Theater in Berlin. His work looks at how minorities perform their identities and how their performances can be a reservoir for meaning and a repo repository for undocumented history, and how further connections between science and the arts need to be sustained to shape the future of our societies. Adham is a PhD candidate at uh, New York University's Performance Studies Department and previously studied political science at Science Po in Paris, choreography in Amsterdam Theater School, and pharmacy, at and pharmacy and literature in Cairo, Egypt. Thank you so much, Nusha, for this lovely introduction. And it's happy to be uh, back another time here with you all. Thank you for coming today. I wanted to talk about something that I've been involved with for the past couple of years and maybe many of us uh, heard about, especially the last year, which is the relation between blockchain and the arts. What's generally described as Web 3.0, the arts, whatever that means, particularly in relation to certain major sales that happen in the NFT space. Can talk very briefly about what NFTs are and what these tokens are for those who don't know. Non fungible tokens or NFTs for short is essentially a way of proving uh, ownership of a digital asset on the blockchain. Technology allowed a lot of artists to claim ownership, first of all, of work that they own, to organize themselves into different kinds of relationships thanks to this technology that they cannot do in. In the physical, it gets hard when I start saying the real world and the virtual and the physical. It gets really complicated once we talk more into these terms. But basically, by setting up uh, these smart contracts, which are contracts that are uh, auto executable. So once you create them and you have a certain set of percentages, you take 10%, the composer takes 20%, and so on. You set these percentages in the smart contract, then it's automatically executing itself. So you don't have to follow on it. If you're an artist that sells one painting, you can write into the smart contract a certain kind of royalty where basically every secondary and third sale, you still get money from the artwork that you're selling. Unlike in the physical art world, if you sell a painting to a collector and he buys it for a thousand dollars, and then next year he goes and sells it for a million, you don't make anything from the secondary sale. So the blockchain came with many promises to help solve problems that exist in the real physical traditional art world that we know, whether traditional as in paintings and sculptures or traditional as digital art within a traditional art market and a non-digital art economy. A couple of years ago, me and my colleagues that have been working together with the Haraka platform that Nusha just briefly presented, we decided to create a platform called Wizara, and the address is wizara.io. Um, everything's there, the project we've been doing. And why we wanted to create it is because we felt that the blockchain world as it is now for the artists is not very inclusive. First of all, most of these websites are only in English. So if you don't speak English, it makes it hard to use anything. Second of all, it's a bit difficult to understand at first, what is, what happened? What is Web3? When did this happen? <laughs> is this the same internet that I have now? What is the back end and the front end? There's so much that if you're an artist, you're not, you're not expected to know it. It's yeah, if you're a software engineer and then you're expected to know the different positions of ballet, what is the fifth position? Why would you need to know it? But suddenly artists had to know these things and they have to understand what is a digital wallet and what is an ERC721. And that's why we started with Zara, because we just felt that this new art economy that is coming with these big promises of accessibility, decentralization, transparency, we felt that, well, we need to make sure that other communities of artists are also represented and they have a place at the table as early on as now. So we started with a focus on Arab and African and Asian artists, regardless whether they live in New York or they live back home in their countries, by doing translations, working between different languages, uh, workshops with artists and institutions, advising institutions on if they want to adopt tools from 
blockchain or what 3.0 and or they just want to explore the possibility of a digital economy and what it could do for their institution so between commissioning curating consulting we produced over 200 works last year alone then came the question of data we were thinking if everything is accessible and if everything is transparent and these are main promises from the blockchain how do we learn about what's happening what kind of data is available how does it help the artists some answers were more obvious than others. For instance, the smart contract is public. So anyone, if you go on our website and there is an exhibition that is running and you click on the smart contract of any of the minted works of any of the NFTs, you can see everything. You can see every wallet that interacted with it, when, what day, for how many seconds. This is already a very big quantum leap away from, I don't want to say away, but like towards another direction. It is not the kind of obscurity that we know in the arts world. I mean. You go to a gallery and you don't know how many works were sold to who, for how much. Now, the second question here is, does it matter? Do we need to know this as artists? Do we need to know this as curators and as specialists in the fields? Second question that we had when we were working is how this data is collected. Most of the data that is available on blockchain activity and NFT artworks are collected from things that are happening between the East and West Coast here in America. So they're very specific. They look at a very specific market, and this is why it is easy then to read things in the press like, this is just a bubble and it's going to burst. We don't know that because we don't look at NFT platforms in Saudi Arabia or Kenya or India. The way we look at things and the way that we structure how the data will be produced and then analyzed shapes the discourse and shapes how we think the economy is actually behaving, but we actually don't have a fuller picture. And then something else happened, which I think is interesting. Some of the major platforms of NFTs online started partnering up with data analysis. The NFT platform that I was talking about, OpenSea, partnered up with Parse IQ or Parsec, as I say it. Basically, what it does is that it monitors specific on-chain events and then triggers a bunch of actions. So it goes and looks at how many active digital wallets are on that website today or dealing with this particular collection of artworks. How many were sold and bought? What is the floor price of a certain exhibition or an auction? And then you can choose as a user on this platform, so you're an artist or a collector or a curator, you can choose to get real-time updates of everything that is happening that is being extracted and analyzed uh, from these data sets, which is crazy because you can choose to get it on your phone, on Twitter, or subscribe to a Discord uh, server. Now, this is the second question that I also leave open. Is this the new art market that we're living in? And is this the driving force that this market will be going through? That it is that driven that you go to collect or buy artworks basically based on data and alerts that you got that this collection is going to rise in price and this is why you speculate and acquire the work. And not it's not just that the big websites are doing this. There's also smaller informal websites. There are tutorials. And if you go attend the tutorial, you might be rewarded in cryptocurrencies or NFTs. So the, there's a very large conversation around the use of data and how it drives the market in the NFT space. We, so again, how we analyze it and do we know if it's a $25 billion industry or is it a $45 billion industry? This is the range that they're talking between 25 and 45. Again, we're looking at data coming from very particular websites. We're not looking at the fuller picture. We know that we are witnessing something very different, that there is a, another way for artists to deal with the markets whether this is going to be the mainstream way of dealing with it, whether these digital tools are going to be incorporated in every gallery, whether they're selling digital art or, again, as I said, sculptures or paintings, we don't know. But then the question is, how do we make sure that this process, if it continues to evolve, that it actually remains open and it remains informed beyond the illusion of a center and a periphery so it wouldn't just look at the cities where we think that dense cultural practice is happening while actually, when you look at the bigger data picture, Nigeria uses the blockchain just as much as the entire continent of North America does. So when you think of comparisons like this, we really need to start looking at how we collect data differently. And the art scene world, I believe, should really start thinking what to do with this data. If this is a way to go forward, then we need to start thinking of a kind of data literacy for people involved in the visual arts or the performing arts scene as we get closer and faster towards the blockchain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to ask my panelists if they have a favorite open data set, uh, especially related to New York City. I'm going to go first, though. My favorite open data set is the 2018 Central Park Squirrel Census. But this story part is my favorite because the 72 volunteers who are squirrel sighters, 
they enter their stories and observations through the app. And it is so cute and so funny. When you go through it, I'm going to read a few. So like th there are different categories, different columns. One of the columns that is my favorite is accidental poems. Not all of the observations are marked as accidental poems, but one of them is squirrel number one and squirrel number four interacted. And squirrels number eight and nine, very red, bird poop. And not, interestingly, not all of the observations are related to squirrels. Sometimes it's about it environment, other species, people. This one is one inch worm found its way onto this counter's shoulder. The veining sun left the air cool and calm. That was an, another accidental poem. You can just cross -check section, I don't know, squirrels acting odd, which was also funny. That was my favorite. Do you have a favorite of an data set, Yakov? Hey, yeah. So I cheated because I knew this question beforehand. My favorite data set, and it's not, it's the New York City prison data set because those are people who don't really meet. Only way I get to interact with people who are in prison. And as of today, there are 5,688 people in custody in New York City. Not my favorite information. But... Yes, and I'm not sure if this is a data set because I'm diving deep and deep into the NFT and the blockchain world. One of the very expected, when I was listening also to Yakov, I was like, yeah, it rings about one of the very <laughs> expected results when you look at gender. Yes, of course, the majority of artists in the NFT space that are making big sales are men and are white, which we expected when we were looking for it. And that, in a way, uh, made us take a very clear decision from the beginning. And this is why we're like, okay, we are starting with artists that are not represented, that nobody invites to even such conversations about Web 3.0 or digital tools or blockchain and the arts. And that we're going to work mostly with uh, women and with queer people. Last year, out of the 200 works that we produced, 95% were women of color and queer people. So in a way, yeah, thanks to finding that, which again was very expected, we were like, okay, we've got work to do. Anel, what about you? Do you have a favorite open data? I mentioned one in my presentation related to NYC specifically, which was NYC. Uh, street trees map where you can basically find information on the every tree that is like right in front of your house and know your neighbor bit better. But along the same lines, there is another, another platform that I really enjoy called What Is Me See by anthropologist Maya Lin. And it is a platform where people share their memories of things that are disappearing from the world. And you can find like specifically in New York City or any other city that you are from, like what are the species that have been missing? What are the changes in the topography of it? And I think it's a very beautiful collective database. Thank you. Thank you all well, uh, for listening. We will be hearing your questions and comments. All of our panels are available to answer. I'd be interested to hear more about your studies and performance art and open data. Is that something that there's a community of, or is it something that is more super niche that you pursued? That's a good question. No, the reason I started this was that because I have degrees in performance studies and in engineering, and I see the gaps in between those worlds. And no, there is no community. Actually, we are lo actively looking for people whose work lies in, in the intersection of data science and performance studies. And I like to think that I coined data performance term. I don't know, but I, I really like to continue this because I think data is really performative and f for both the people who collect the data, for people who are subjects of the data and people who use it. And for example, the, the, my favorite data set, like e each squirrel cider uh, is performing an observation, is writing a poem, is writing an observation. And like the performativity of it, it's very highlighted here, but in every data set, it, it, I think data is very performative and that, that's why we started this. And yeah, we are looking for a community if I hope we, we build one. Yeah, I join uh, forces with Nusha. We are actively looking for a community. And I, I also, w w like when I started working on this, I was like, why isn't everybody asking these questions, especially now that we're moving towards a lot of interaction in the virtual world. The past two years with Zoom and a lot of virtual worlds were built for people to meet together in an interesting way. So we're literally performing inside of digital worlds. And this interconnection between data and performance is becoming even more evident and more obvious than before. So I really do hope to connect people across different realms and worlds, both as in 
from the fields of coding and engineering and that of performance, but also like from New York with people in Cairo or from wherever, because the conversations that are happening touch upon also the, uh, how do we code and the algorithm and the bias of the algorithm that NL was touching on, that these are not self-generating codes. These are written by people that correspond to certain boards of directors that have certain interests. So if this is allowed to appear on Instagram or be uh, made invisible, these are decisions not made by machine. So we do really need to talk more between the ones that talk and the ones that code together. True. I, could just, I just want to emphasize that people who perform and the people who code need to hang out. Uh, Definitely. I just wanted to add maybe a couple of resources for people if they would want to check out. It's not in particular the performance and data, mm -hmm. but also the community of people who are interested in the questions of justice related to yeah. algorithms and to a collection of data. Uh, it is Data and Society, which is the organization in New York City, but and also the new platform Just Tech. Both of them are related to like social science studies. And I think humanities should like integrate more into those conversations. So I just support all other uh, people on this panel. Let's make a community. Thank you again. Come talk with us if you have any more questions or comments. And yep.